after my bar mitzvah, we went to Japan, uh, spending all together maybe some months and a half in Japan, at first in one particular place, but then traveling uh, over a good part of the main island at least. Uh, that was a very important experience because uh, I had never been outside of Manchuria before, not counting the place I was born originally in. And because uh, I had an image of Japan, which of course was soon to play a very important role both uh, in our lives in Manchuria, indeed or by that time already was playing a very important role in our lives, as I'm saying in a moment, and also of course uh, in my life later on after I came to Berkeley and uh, with Pearl Harbor and the war in the Pacific, etc., etc., etc. I was talking about the various reasons why myself and I think also Misha were leading a more sheltered life than most of our friends, and that is that we were the nephews of a very rich man. And uh, Harbin was not devoid of crime, especially in the later years, 1930s, I was speaking about that. There were quite a few kidnappings. In fact, my father was once kidnapped from his own uh, apartment. The kidnappings, of course, were by the police, uh, not by real bandits, but also some. The distinction was not always clear. Those who directed traffic and uh, walked the beats were Chinese, armed not so much with hand pistols as with uh, rather imposing long rifles. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the officers were usually Russian, and these Russian officers, whatever some of them might have been, were not without their black sheep, and these black sheep were not beyond pulling a few things uh, and then uh, solving uh, some of the crimes at somebody else's expense or something like that. And even Uncle Lova himself, this was already after I uh, was uh, in America, was almost, almost kidnapped, but uh, for a shall we say, very personal reason, they didn't manage to kidnap him. So there was always that fear. And because of that, we were told, you know, not to stray too far, and not to go there, and not to go there, and always want to know where we were, etc., which obviously tended to limit our uh, mobility quite considerably. So. Now here is an interesting picture. It's a picture that sort of uh, etched itself in our minds, the three of us, Misha and myself, almost inseparable bodies. We used to sit in school, usually at the same desk next to each other. Oh, yeah. And you remember in the German school, we were photographed next to each other yeah. and so on. Inseparable bodies. And Misha's uh, brother, six years younger, Lucia, who was a jolly fellow, as he's a rather jolly older man now. Now, this was taken in 1935. In 1992, the three of us met in Seattle at the home of David Grossman and Lucy and his wife Mara arrived there with a great idea and said let's recreate that picture <laughs> in 1992, meaning 57 years later. And this is the uh, second picture, the later picture here. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Oh, very good. Very good. <laughs> This is my father in the uh, middle 30s, in his middle 40s approximately, again in formal dress. Here he is with my mother, I think this may be a few years earlier. Do you remember these moments when you went to the... Uh, I the certainly history? remember moments of going to a photographer now, mm -hmm. which moment, of course, corresponds to which photograph I don't remember, but... Uh, yeah. Oh yes. There was very little snap shooting. We had cameras, so I had the box camera. But it was never regarded as something very serious. Is this something you would do spontaneously? Hey, let's go this weekend to the photographer. No, 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 or would no, this no. be an annual event at a certain time no, of year? No, it would be planned for some time. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, one would dress up just for the photographer, too, the way you see in this picture. But sometimes uh, it corresponded maybe with some kind of occasion for which you would dress up anyway. Mm, quite a good figure. What did you expect? Well. Uh, a joint uh, picture of the two families, uh, the three boys. What I wanted to, however, do is take advantage of a particular photograph to speak about a very peculiar urban institution. 
It is this photograph which shows myself and a third person. A third person happens to be, if I remember correctly, an American by the name of Hansen, who was serving as the American consul in Herbin. You can see that Hansen is not a Russian or of Russian origin, because no Russian in his right mind would ever wear this kind of uh, felt hat in winter. You must also realize that the temperature probably was somewhere around minus 25 at that moment. And you know that it was very cold because we're all sitting on a bench covered with some kind of fur blanket on a river which at this point is all ice. And the ice would be probably 10, 15 feet thick. Now, it is the ice that produced this special institution have been, because what we see here is a vehicle of sorts. And fortunately, we see both the vehicle that the three persons are sitting on and a second vehicle to the side so that we can see the construction of that vehicle. Was that your father with you? Oh, yes, it's <coughs> father, and the fur hat is my father. Okay. You see, what the vehicle is, is basically a sled. Runners, a wooden platform, and the wooden platform, a wooden bench some kind of blanket on the bench so that that part of your anatomy would not freeze in minus 25 degree weather quickly, and uh, a very warm blanket over you. Then uh, the way the vehicle would operate would be not by uh, uh, an internal combustion engine or pulled by uh, horses or anything, but pushed by a Chinese with a long steel-tipped pole, which he would hold between his legs. He would stand behind the bench, behind the passengers, and he would repeatedly push the sled away by pushing against the ice with the iron-tipped pole. There used to be, oh, if not hundreds and scores and scores of such devices in winter on the ice all over, the people who operated them would sweep path over the ice and they would sweep away the snow and whatever else. So it would be open and bare ice. And they could develop that way a most enormous speed. You can't imagine how fast they would go after a while. Because it was pure ice pushing away between their legs and before long you were going about 60 miles an hour on that ice. <laughs> <laughs> in minus 25 degree weather, so you had to keep your cheeks <laughs> covered or you could freeze them off. It was a tremendous thrill. <laughs> now, to some extent, uh, these vehicles were used for just ferrying people from one side of the river to another. Most of Harbin was on one side of the river. I think most of their business came from those who just wanted the thrill. On a sunny Sunday like this, with the sun just barely warming your face, Shooting you know, for miles and miles back and forth at 60 miles an hour on the ice was the, the kind of thrill <laughs> that really cannot even be described. This kind of device, so far as I know, existed only in Herbin. I've never heard of this kind of contraption operating anywhere else. Wow. To some extent, this is also confirmed by the name of the contraption, because in, uh, in the same pigeon Russian that was used for everything, the name of this vehicle was Talkai Talkai. Talkai Talkai. Talkai Talkai is simply uh, Russian for push push. <laughs> so you would go, you would hire a push push for, well, you couldn't probably stand it more than half an hour because of the cold, but, but you would hire it for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or from here to the bridge and back or something like <laughs> that and just have this thrillful experience. One of the uh, less pleasant distinctive features of Manchuria and Herbin was that in a short span of a couple of generations that Russian Herbin existed, it saw a great number of upheavals and perturbations. There was the Japanese war that has been mentioned several times, the Russian Revolution, which of course spilled over into Herbin in a sense. And then the takeover of the railroad by the Soviets, which was, as I mentioned, not a very upsetting fact, only partly so. 
then in 1929 there was a war that very few people know about, a war between the Soviet Union and China. Very few people know about it. It was a short war in a far away place in northern Manchuria where the Soviet troops invaded from Siberia. Fortunately, fortunately for us, they never reached Harbin. They stopped before Harbin having achieved uh, whatever diplomatic aim they intended to achieve with the Chinese. But uh, you might imagine there was considerable panic in Harbin with 100,000 people of whom, or most of whom, were uh, refugees from the Soviet Union, strongly anti-Soviet, capitalists and whatnot. And technically many of them Soviet citizens too. We came out of Russia as Soviet citizens, my family and Misha's family, but then we all renounced our Soviet citizenship. Did you have a citizenship at that point? Well, we were essentially stateless. Most of the people in Hebron were stateless. Many of them carrying something that was an important thing in those days, but few people know of it now, the Nansen passport. Nansen was a Norwegian explorer and worldwide do-gooder. And he realized that during the interwar period, as a result of the First World War and all the revolutions, all the changes, there were millions of people in the world that ended up to be stateless. So uh, what he organized, which was really a very good thing for very many people, was a kind of office or something somewhere, which issued pieces of paper with photographs and so on, Nansen papers. It gave no protection. You have no protection at all. There were no consulates and no embassies to protect you and so on. But there were pages on which the border guards or the consulates of other countries could put stamps so that you could travel. And uh, countries recognize that as a tra travel That's document. right, as a travel document. Well, it was a remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. However, what happened there was that in the late 30s, um, Uncle Lyoba raised the question as to whether we might not be able to get Polish passports because of some very tenuous connection. And the um, Polish authorities were very dubious of that, but uh, so the resolution of that was our whole family got Polish passports, but they were all marked temporary until the Polish authorities would resolve the question. Fortunately, the Polish word for temporary, Timczasowe, is not understood by anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's even, even the Russian word would be different. These things were only in Polish, so there was no translation in this? Well, th that word was only in Polish. So I traveled to this country on such a passport. And who, who in San Francisco would have known uh, what that was? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is the passport that the rest of it, uh, Misha traveled on and so on. And then, of course, when Poland fell, in September 1939, there was nobody to, to change that passport or nobody to recall that passport. And, but was the passport worth anything anyway? Well, it was, uh, it was a kind of glorified Nansen passport. It wasn't right, worth, right. Because if you turn to protection before 1939 to some Polish embassy or a consul, they of course would see the word Tim Chesove. Right. And say, well, why, was it, why is it Tim Chesove? And then, of course, you'd have to do a lot of explaining. <laughs> But, uh, but then, of course, Poland fell, so there were no more Polish embassies to ask these questions. <laughs> and obviously, if it expired, well, the answer was very simple, because Poland expired. <laughs> now, uh, those of us who immigrated in the United States actually had an uh, easy time immigrating, because at that time, the quota system, the national quota system, existed in the United States. And if, say, you wanted to come actually from Poland or from Romania or Hungary or Italy or Greece, you had to wait years and years until your turn came to receive a, a, a spot in, on the quota. But if you were born in Russia, as I was, and Misha was, and my parents were, and that was simple because there was a large Russian quota that was always empty since nobody was uh, allowed by Stalin to leave Russia. <laughs> So I was, in a sense, a beneficiary of Stalin. Only uh, some people who had escaped earlier immigrants, such as ourselves, with Russian place of birth, were eligible to come under that quota. It seems for so many of those years, it, it, you guys kept falling through these funny little cracks, so that uh, everybody well, else was getting to, caught. I have something to, to tell you. Everybody else was getting caught, and you kept falling through the little cracks all the way down the line. Whether it's I, I have something to or, tell you. Yeah. That, uh, that people have been falling through these little cracks for 2,000 years if their descendants are alive today. Those who didn't fall through the cracks, uh, 
they descend as another life today. I consider myself to have been fantastically lucky in my life. Fantastically lucky. We haven't talked about the war or anything, but fantastically lucky. I wanted, in fact, somehow to to make this point towards the end of our discussion, after we have seen all these cracks. <laughs> Just think of the incredible luck that the house we're now sitting in didn't burn in the fire. So there was that Soviet attack in 1929, which uh, scared the wits out of us. And then there was uh, 1930, which also scared the wits out of us, and that is the onset of the Great Depression. The uh, effect of the Great Depression was particularly hard on what is known as primary producers. That is countries or firms that produce raw materials. The economic base of Manchuria, and especially of Harbin, was the export of soybeans, as I already said. And soybeans, like everything else, tumbled in price very fast. So that hit Manchuria very hard. Nonetheless, I say this with considerable caution because obviously our family was very well off. But the poets continued to write poetry and local journals continued to publish them and the, the operas and theaters continued to be put on and the libraries continued to lend books and so on and, uh, and people still, still lived. It was a lively bubbling town. So in 1930 came the Depression. Of course it outlasted me in Herbin. I left in 1938. Then, in, in September 1931, came the famous Mukden incident. Now, the Japanese, by that time, in Japan, were undergoing some serious political perturbations themselves. To put it in one word, the extreme nationalists and the militarists were taking over power. And that meant expansion. And they were encouraged, of course, first by the fact that the rest of the world seemed to be on the brink of war, and so in their own corner of the world they thought that they could do their own bit of mayhem. And in part because they saw the Soviet Union building up and they wanted to create more strength to confront the Soviet Union if necessary. They also had their quarrels with America and, and so on and so forth. They went on a rampage which did not stop until the end of 1945. The first phase of this rampage was to conquer all of Manchuria and to take control of the very rich natural resources of Manchuria which would complement Japan's industry operating on very lean natural resources of its own. These resources briefly included what? Well, uh, very rich coal mines, iron ore, very, very rich timber resources since a very large part of the country was covered with primeval forests. And so uh, in September, September 18th, 1931, we suddenly woke up to read the headlines that there was an incident. Somebody shot a few rifle shots at the passing Japanese train. And in order to uh, punish the culprits and prevent anything like that, the Japanese suddenly spread out their armies all over Manchuria, uh, fighting the Chinese. The Chinese were no match for them. Was it ever proven that Mukden was a ruse, that it was uh, set up? You have a very good question, but I, I can assure you that anybody at that time or since knowing anything about it would only laugh at that question. Because? Well, because it was obvious. Because obviously the Japanese military might was so much greater than any Chinese, no Chinese nobody would. would do it. And, and secondly, even if somebody shot a few shots, which is very doubtful, that was no reason to invade a territory that was larger than France and Germany combined. So from that point on, Manchuria had been much more occupied by the Japanese. But immediately what it meant was that life in Harbin became more complicated. It became more complicated not so much because of the Japanese themselves, although they were causing complications, uh, but they also were interested in stability and interested in building up the country and uh, for their own purposes. It is true that uh, there was pressure put on Ankolova to 
take in Japanese partners, and indeed in 1934, a corporation was established, the North Manchurian Sugar Industrial Company. Uh, but I think that relations, you know, once this fact was accepted, relations were actually good. There was a Russian fascist party, swastikas and black shirts and jack boots and all, in Russia even before the Japanese came in. But basically they gave a lot more scope of action for them and they, they caused, caused trouble. On the surface, the trouble was not the kind of trouble that uh, many of the Jews in Herben were unaccustomed to, namely publishing a vehement anti-Semitic newspaper and anti-Semitic posters and all that. The trouble was more that uh, then they proceeded to extort money and kidnap people, and there were several very famous cases of kidnapping of uh, wealthy Jews, and it was generally assumed it was the fascists who were doing it. And one day, I was already in Berkeley, they came to Uncle Lova's house, they came and they uh, grabbed him, and uh, there was a rather sturdy fence, and there was a breach in it somewhere. And for some reason, they they couldn't uh, open the gate, so they tried to push him through a breach in the in that fence. And he, being by that one quite fortunately, wouldn't go through. And they finally gave up. <laughs> this is a case of not falling through the cracks. <laughs> That's right. So they finally gave up. At that point, of course, Uncle uh, Lover went to his Japanese partners, who went to the Japanese authorities, and although the, some of the Japanese authorities may very well have known about it beforehand, they realized that things were being pushed a little too far, and they caught some of these guys, knowing probably full well who they were beforehand, and put, uh, put them in jail. At a certain point, uh, the chief kidnapper was released from jail. And when, uh, at that point, uh, Uncle Leo was in Japan, as it happened, and Polly was in Harbin, and Polly heard about it. And uh, my uncle uh, telegraphed her immediately, pack your bag and go to Japan immediately, because he knew that that man would try to wreak revenge. Hmm. And soon thereafter, my father also left. I remember years ago, Polly telling me a little bit about that story, and what I wanted to add was that uh, he apparently told her, just take nothing with you. Act as if you're just going into town yeah, and yeah. go. That's probably even more correct. She, yeah. Yeah, uh, she liked to understandably to tell that story, and, and, and she probably used the same words to you, but she said, I didn't tell the chauffeur, I didn't tell anyone, I picked up my purse, and I took a taxi cab, and I went right to the railroad station. I left. I walked out and left it all. That's, that's what she told me. Uh, going back in time, in 1937, before Misha and I graduated from Tinsing Grammar School, in July, there was another incident. You see, I spoke to you about the foreign concessions. There were British, French, it Italian, uh, Japanese, uh, Belgian, there used to be Austrian and German, but since Austrian and Germans lost the first World War, they also lost those concessions. Not American, because the Americans never wanted a concession there, given the general foreign policy opposed to colonialism and imperialism and so on, and particularly since America always argued for an open door in China. So Americans never, but the Americans did have troops in Tintin when I was there. There was one regiment of the 15th Infantry stationed there and they were stationed on the territory of the old German concession. And actually, we were very glad that they were there because uh, that added the stability to the place. But there were also French troops and uh, an Italian contingent, so and there was also a Japanese contingent there. Now, all these foreign concessions stemmed from the events of the turn of the century when there was a bloody uprising in China. The, all the foreigners were uh, besieged there in so-called delegation court, and, and the foreign powers, of whom, incidentally, the Russians sent the most troops, had to directly intervene to lift that siege and rescue those foreigners, and then, of course, the Chinese government had to pay for that, so the Chinese government was very weak. And one way it paid for that was by granting concessions of this sort. So there was also a Japanese concession. 
And one of those Japanese troops uh, happened to take a walk, and somebody shot at them. Oddly enough. Oddly enough. Uh, uh, they walked about halfway to Beijing to a place called Marco Polo Bridge. And so it is known as the Marco Polo Bridge incident. And the consequence of that was that they proceeded to invade all of China. So you see, not many people believed in these incidents. <laughs> but for us it was very important because we had to return to school by end of August. And there was fighting still going on over that. And that was one of the more remarkable trips I ever took. Again, my mother took us by Japanese uh, ship from Dairen to a place called Taku, which is at the estuary of the river. That ship was too large to go up that river. And there we changed to a Chinese small mother ship and so on. But the fighting had been going on here only recently. The Japanese were patrolling the river with uh, their gunboats, we saw them all over. But what you also saw is lots of corpses floating in the river. They most, were mostly Chinese, of course, because the Japanese had the power. When you say lots of corpses, what does that mean? A corpse would be visible from our boat every 20 minutes or so. And the trip took several hours, or six hours. Thank you. There's one woman in this world or was in this world, we all owe a great deal to. And that was Gregory's mother, who was a very powerful woman. And she went through enemy lines during the Japanese-Chinese War, taking these two young men at that time, Gregory and Misha, to school in Tianjin. Had she not had the guts to do that, and I'm not sure any of us here could do that. And we're all grateful to her, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was, that was quite a trip. That trip to I think it was. That was when I hear the story, you know, Misha courted me on that story. <laughs> it's amazing I didn't leave immediately. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize. I kept saying, you're kidding. That's kind of a delayed effect. <laughs>